In a shocking move, the U.S. State Department said it would not support violent opposition toward the Taliban government. The response by government officials followed a very successful ambush by the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan against Taliban fighters in the northern part of Afghanistan. To talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, the Taliban is considered a terrorist organization. Is this not a good thing? You would think so. But when you look at the optics here, not only is the State Department saying that the uh, Afghan resistance forces are, should not fight against the, the Taliban and that they don't support it. They also said that they hope that other countries don't support this. Um, it, it's crazy. Let's start with that. The fact that these are either from the former government and, and military personnel or they are ordinary Afghan civilians. And they are they're basically freedom fighters. And they were able to um, claim victory in a, in a small province. Uh, and when this was publicized, uh, we reached out from the foreign desk to the State Department and their response was, uh -uh, we, we don't uh, support this. We actually condemn this and we hope that other countries follow suit. Uh, Mind boggling. But when you look at the optics, when you look at the other points here, the, the withdrawal from, from uh, Afghanistan by the United States, we know that we had to leave. Did we have to leave the way that we did? Did we have to leave all of those um, millions and millions of dollars of military equipment and technology for the, the Taliban. Did we have to, since then, give them $1 billion in aid? It hasn't even been a year yet. Biden met with um, Afghan, uh, sorry, Taliban officials right after the earthquake last week uh, and promised them more funding because of the earthquake. Now, will that money go for civilians and for the repair of infrastructure in the aftermath of the earthquake? I highly doubt it. It will go for more terrorism. Now, the aid that we give to the Taliban, it doesn't even come with a set of preconditions or maybe some suggestions. Let the women go to school. Stop using the money for terrorism. You know, let women come out of the house without a male uh, escort or a chaperone. I mean, it is mind boggling to think where the United States is standing on this issue. And again, on the heels of President Biden making his trip out to the Middle East to meet with our key allies, the uh, Israel and, and the Saudis. I mean, how does this look when they are begging the Iranians at the negotiating table on the one hand, giving the Taliban, a terror organization, billions of dollars to do what? Put it back into terrorism in the region. So it's it's really, it's always opposite day at the White House, you know, recently. And, uh, you know, it's you just can't make this stuff up. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Lisa, a Hamas chief and other senior officials of the Gaza ruling terror group said it was incumbent on the Palestinians to start looking to form more alliances with Russia, China and Iran once the war between Ukraine and Russia is over. I would have thought that Hamas would have already strengthened ties with some of those countries already. Exactly, Hal, and that assumption is, is absolutely correct because the first, they're getting funding by the Iran regime anyway. And when you look at the axis that they have created, the rogue nations of the world it is Venezuela and Russia and China, and North Korea, Iran. Uh, these are the, the countries that are banding together. Of course, China leading the pack. Uh, the Taliban have made nice with China. Uh, the Russians are making nice with China. Iran has made nice with China. Uh, and of course, why wouldn't the Palestinians then do the same? Now, this is both tongue in cheek and it is, it is factual. Factual because, as I said, this is the alliance that they belong to at this point, right? And more tongue in cheek because they want to say to the United States, wait a minute, if you're going to be nice to uh, Israel, if you're going to uh, not take our side, because they they banked on the, the, the assumption that the Biden administration would reverse everything that was done under the Trump uh, administration. So obviously, President Trump was extremely friendly with Israel. They moved the embassy uh, to uh, Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. Um, they actually, you know, they announced that um, the settlement or actually legitimate, which was a great move. Uh, and obviously very, very friendly relations during that entire time. The Abraham Accords, of course, brought a whole new chapter to the Middle East and Israel's relationships with its neighbors. And then when the Biden administration came to power, we would think, well, they did, did a, a reverse on all foreign policy uh, achievements of the, the Trump White House. And you would think and they would believe that that, that would be the same for the, the Palestinians. What they did do is reinstate aid to the Palestinians 
Palestinians. Um, they did not move the embassy. They did not renege on the Abraham Accord. So the Palestinians are kind of like, we, we expected more. We want more out of this. Um, and to make this kind of announcement to say, we're going to align ourselves with the bad guys, it's kind of to say to the White House, you better move before we find new friends. Um, and, you know, it's, it's to be expected. This is what a weak foreign policy leads to. And, you know, when you connect the dots, it all starts out from the White House podium. A new report says American money committed to Ukraine, Lisa, has already exceeded the cost of the first five years of the Afghan war. Overall, the U.S. has promised at least $54 billion in spending related to the war. Now, direct military-related spending on the Ukraine war has reached around $8 billion, and the U.S. spent around, what, $7.4 billion in the first five wars in the fight against the Taliban? Yes, a lot of numbers you threw out there, but yes, we are... We are committed to this Ukraine war, and where is it going? I mean, what is the end result? I saw this meme on Instagram that perfectly said it. We have spent, in the United States, have spent five times the amount we would have spent securing our border, which was the wall that President Trump wanted to create. We have spent five times that amount to help Ukraine fortify its border. I mean, really let that sink in. And it's crazy to think that, uh, you know, we here are not prioritizing national security and also our, our, our regional security and putting money into a war that's not going anywhere. Just over the weekend, we, we pledged another $400 million. Uh, Secretary Blinken came out and said, we want to help the Ukrainians with another $400 million. It's every day that they come out with another pledge of millions and millions of dollars. And again, to what end? We know that the Russians are advancing at a, at a rate that the Ukrainians could never keep up with, regardless of how much money or military equipment we're providing them with. And again, to what end? Where, where will this all go? How will this all end? Yeah, I'm just wondering again, like you and I've talked about in the past, if uh, Ukraine President Zelensky and Russia President Putin will sit down and say, you know what, maybe we should have some sort of a compromise here such as some of the Ukraine eastern states that Russia is so heavily involved in and they want to take over, so maybe annex some of that into Russia? I don't know. There are no easy answers at this point, but we do want to see peace and an end of the war soon. Absolutely. And I will tell you, we're working on a story here at the Foreign Desk. It, just, it hasn't been published, but it will be um, today, uh, about you know Putin is now offering um, Russian citizenship to, to Ukrainians. And that will probably be the next step. And the question then becomes, is this the off-ramp? Is this the moment we've been waiting for where Russia comes in and says, listen, if you really want to see this come to an end, you want to have negotiations and some sort of concessions. I'm saying Ukrainians become Russians and we call it an end of the day. I mean, th there may not be any other way out. But And then we have interviewed um, Ukrainians who are for this. They actually believe that they'll be safer and well protected and, um, you know, under under the Russian flag. And, and that might be an option for them. Others obviously want to fight back and they're rolling up their sleeves and getting out there. And uh, they, they do want to uh, obviously maintain their Ukrainian identity. So we will have to see if this is an option, if it will happen and if this may, in fact, be the best case scenario in this situation. Lisa, Israel's prime minister called for peace with Saudi Arabia and normalized ties with Arab nations ahead of U.S. President Joe Biden's planned Middle Eastern trip this week. Now, Lisa, Biden will be the first American president to fly from Israel directly to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? It's really a... a, a, a a telling moment uh, on how far the Abraham Accords have brought us. Of course, Saudi Arabia is not signatory to the Accords just yet. That is the big godfather that everybody has been waiting for, meaning if Israel has been able to strike an accord with moderate Arab states, well, it prob those Arab states probably did get the nod from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and now will Saudi Arabia publicly come and sign on to this accord. Now, behind the scenes, we know that Israel and Saudi Arabia are, um, are, are, are partnered up in many, many initiatives, uh, obviously both of them having the interest of keeping uh, Iran's influence at bay. Uh, and right now, this is where the, our foreign policy is, is going in terms of creating situations with um, nations and, and elements that have 
aligned interests. They may not be best of friends in every way, uh, and you won't see Saudis really become Zionist or become pro-Israel in, in, in that way. But when it comes to really maintaining um, certain, certain alignment for the region, they obviously are uh, both on the same page. And now ahead of President Biden's visit, they want to see if that is something that can come to fruition, a formal de declaration of their relationship in adding Saudi Arabia to the accords, right? at least uh, making their relationship much more ironclad than it has been. In a new report by Homeland Security in the United States, an average of 441 unaccompanied kids will cross the U.S.-Mexico into uh, Border Patrol's custody every day this year. Now, the annual projected total lease is close to 161,000 children. The ongoing border crisis continues in your country. Absolutely. Uh, this is a devastating story. And the reason why it's devastating, not only because the children come over and that they are risking their lives and um, have to deal with that anxiety and fear of traveling alone and, and making this very dangerous trip on their own. What happens when they get here is that it's it's illegal for the United States to send them back home if they don't belong to an adjacent nation, meaning if they're Canadian, they can get sent back home. If they're Mexican, Mexican, they can get sent back home. But if they're traveling from uh, Guatemala or Nicaragua or any of the other uh, countries that are sending um, their children over through Mexico, they cannot be sent back. So then they become, you know, kind of in, in no man's land until they have, you know, a way of really um, absorbing these children into society or figuring out what to do with them. Um, look, this is the crisis that we we do. I mean, the, we, we wrote about this at the Foreign Desk about how the Biden, um, uh, the Biden administration is, is trying to deal with this. But it is the Biden administration's rhetoric and position and lax position on immigration that has invited these uh, illegals into the country. And again, in a way that is dangerous for them. Last week, 51 of them lost their lives in a truck. There have been so many of these accidents with the journey that they have to come. And again, traveling alone without their parents, what will be the future for these children uh, when they are uh, forced to, to, to face these kinds of obstacles at an early age. Yeah, very, very sad. Lisa, police in Richmond say they've thwarted a planned July 4th mass shooting after receiving a tip that led to arrests of two foreign nationals in the United States illegally and the seizure of multiple guns. Tell me more. Yeah, this is a crazy story when you look at this. Um, one of them had a, an expired visa and the other one had been thrown out twice, I think, from this country. I mean, this is, it's crazy because we talk about how people don't come under the radar, but even when they do in a case like this, it's like nothing has been done. So they get, they got another chance. And what if this, this, um, this plot wasn't foiled, then we would have another, then we would talk about guns. We wouldn't talk about the fact that we have a, a, an influx of people coming into this country, that we have no proper way of vetting them. I mean, in, we just talked about the southern border, but we also have an issue with people coming in from parts of the world where terrorists are, come from and they want to get into this country and they do falsify their, their uh, paperwork. And even when they don't falsify their paperwork, we're not there to check it anyway. It's not like we can call the DMV in Syria or Iraq and say, hello, who is this person? Can we vet them? Can we figure out who they are before we let them into this country. And then we have no way of, of, of really keeping uh, track of these individuals. It's really a wake up call. I mean, again, we can get this right one time to foil a plot, but how about the next time when we are not able to get ahead of, of, of the terrorists? And this is one of those situations where really you have to look at the system and say it's flawed, it's broken. We need to really keep an eye, be more vigilant of the people coming into the country. Lisa, a lot of social media platforms you and I have talked about in the past is simply full of uh, trolls and uh, a lot of bots. Now there's one particular tweet that went viral on Twitter that's gotten a lot of people's attention. A number of people are saying that Anne Frank, who was hunted and killed by Nazis, had white privilege while she was alive. This is unbelievable. I, it's, I don't, where do we even start on this, right? Um, uh, okay, so genocide of an entire uh, people, six million plus died. Um, she being one of the victims as a 12 year old girl who had to hide out in an attic and um, she's called privileged. I mean, that's all you have to know. I mean, that's that's how crazy we are. We, we've spent our time as journalists, as political commentators, really just um, stating the obvious. 
I mean, this, this, th there's no reason for us to be even having a conversation as to whether or not she had white privilege. We talk about how crazy it is that people are having the conversation. And this is what, you know, what I find myself doing very often these days is really just stating the obvious and saying, this is clown talk. This obviously doesn't, doesn't need to be addressed because anybody who's of sane mind knows that this is a crazy comment to make, but this is what we're dealing with. Again, this is what's going on on um, the social media platforms. This is the conversation that's going on on college campuses. This is what our children and young professionals are taught to fear when they are in the workplace, when they're in the college, when they are in the university classroom, to not even mention certain things that could allude to certain certain things. They have to be, you know, ashamed of their gender if they're male, ashamed of their skin if they're white, ashamed of their religion if they're not X, Y, or Z. And, you know, it's, it's just when will this when will the pendulum swing back? How that's what I want to know. We're talking about the pendulum going so far to one side that it will inevitably swing back, but we're waiting for that time because yeah. praying that it'll come back real soon, Lisa. Yes, we're losing our minds in the meantime. <laughs> our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us once again from Los Angeles. My pleasure.